Matthew 19, 13 says, Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them, but Jesus said, Let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And after laying his hands on them, he departed from there. Now, in this particular passage, we actually see different characters, different, different people that are, that are there in the scene, if you wish. Of course, there's Jesus, He's there. And the apostles, they're there. And there are children, obviously, that are there as well. However, I want you to focus on the people that are not mentioned, but are present. Have you figured out who those people are? The people who are mentioned, not mentioned, but are present? Exactly, somebody had to bring the children to Jesus. And I would dare say that that was probably their parents that brought the children to see and to be with Jesus. What a difference it makes to a child when the parents are consciously leading their children to Jesus Christ. A good illustration of this is told by Carl Brekeen as he describes the history of two families who lived at the same time and they lived in the same place, but they had very different histories, very different consequences for their family lineage. One of the families was started by a man called, and these are, real, these are historical people, a man called Max Dukes. And what we know about Max Dukes is that he did not believe in God, he refused to teach his children, obviously, about, about God, did never brought them to church or any type of religious service. And we know historically about the Max Dukes family that um, he had 1,020 recorded descendants. And of these, 300 had prison terms, 120 were prostitutes, 600 were alcoholics. Millions of dollars were spent in public money and no visible contribution was made to society that we know of by this particular family. This other family lived at the same time, in the same place, in the same social environment as Max Dukes, and that was Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards believed in God, he taught his children to love the Lord, he encouraged them to attend and also serve in the church that they were members of. We know that Jonathan Edwards had 929 recorded descendants. 430 of them were ministers, 86 were university professors, 13 were presidents of the universities, 75 authored good books, five were elected to Congress, two were elected to Senate, and one became the Vice President of the United States. For this reason we see you know, the difference. What a difference it makes when parents lead their children to Jesus Christ. And as far as we know, the major difference between these two families was one consciously brought their children to Christ and the other consciously did not bring their children to Christ. And so for this reason, I'd like to focus our attention on evangelizing children and their ability to respond at a young age to the gospel. Don't you almost wish some other people were here tonight? Don't you wish there were other people here tonight, other families, other moms and dads here tonight to hear this? Thankfully, we're, we're filming these things, so hopefully if you're one of the people saying, boy, I wish my daughter was here, I wish my granddaughter could hear this or whatever, it will be available on video uh, thanks to our brother Hal here. All right, let's talk about a child's responsibility. Discussing the salvation of a child's soul is a sensitive issue because there isn't a uniform opinion as to when a child is fully responsible and accountable for salvation before God. Exactly when does that happen? It's, you know, it's open to debate. 
The problem is that people ask themselves, when does a child resemble an adult enough psychologically and emotionally in order to make a decision about obeying the gospel? That's usually, that's what we're trying to track. When are they, quote, old enough? When are they adult enough you know, emotionally, mentally, you know, where they can make that decision. Now, the problem here is that they use only the psychological measuring stick of human development to measure something which is spiritual in nature and not just psychological. It's interesting to note that in Matthew 18, verse three, Jesus says that an adult has to become like what? Like a child. Jesus says an adult has to become like a child in order to be saved, not the other way around. I believe that a child is subject to the gospel when he or she is old enough to respond to the gospel. Psychologists don't make that decision. Now, I want you to understand, not respond like an adult responds, but respond to the degree that a child can respond. And believe it or not, children can respond to God. Look at 1 Samuel, shall we? If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, 1 Samuel chapter three. I want to read verses, a couple of verses there. As we talk about children responding to God, it says, now the boy, Samuel, was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days, visions were infrequent. And it happened at that time as Eli was lying down in his place, now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. That the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and he went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he answered, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time. And he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for thy servant is listening. Now we know that Samuel was a boy of about eight or ten because in the Hebrew the word boy here that they use is, uh, is a word used to refer to a child of under 12 years of age. And yet as young as he was he heard the call of the Lord. The Lord spoke to him directly. I want you to go to Luke chapter 2 now in the New Testament. Luke chapter two, another instance of a similar example, beginning in verse 41. It says, and his parents, speaking of his meaning Jesus, and his parents used to go to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, they went up there according to custom of the feast. And as they were returning after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem and his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. And it came about that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? 
did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? And so here the story uh, takes place when Jesus is 12 and we see here that he becomes independent of his parents on a spiritual basis. Obviously as we read along it says he went back and he was in, subject and in subjection to them, but spiritually he began to disengage from them hearing uh, the voice of the Lord speaking to others, the teachers, uh, with his own curiosity. In Matthew uh, 19 verse 14 we note that Jesus invites the children to come to him and he warns us against preventing them from doing so. So my point is that children can and they want to respond to Jesus Christ and we should allow them to do so when the desire um, is based on the uh, gospel and is in accordance with the gospel. I want you to notice the following passages. Uh, in Proverbs 4.1, Hear, O sons, the instructions of a father, and give attention that you may gain understanding. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, we read, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Do you notice one similar thing about all these passages? All these passages are speaking directly to children, not to parents. It doesn't say parents teach your children to obey. It says children obey your parents. In these passages, the assumption is made that children can understand and they are responsible for obeying. Now, we know that not every child develops at the same pace. Not every child uh, understands at the same time. However, children are subject to the gospel and should respond to it. When? Well, let's have a few marker points. Let's talk about when should that happen? Well, first of all, they can acknowledge that they believe as true what they have been taught about Jesus. When they can acknowledge as true what they have been taught, they're beginning to be responsible to the gospel. I mean, when you ask a child if he or she believes in Jesus and believes in God and they say, yes, I do, that's faith. I mean, it isn't the deep faith of an elder who's been a Christian for 40 or 50 years, of course not. But it is faith, and it's faith that's uncluttered by doubt or fear, and it's faith that's acceptable before God. You know, I'm always surprised. Uh, people bring their children to services, Sunday school, uh, cradle row, toddlers, children's Bible time, uh, middle school, youth group, and then at a young age they say, well, I, I, I want to become a Christian, I want to be a baptist. Oh no, you're way too young. <laughs> you know, we teach them for 12 years, you know, they hear 10,000 sermons, you, know, you don't think they're paying attention, but they, it comes in there. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, some child, some young person heard the lesson this morning, for example, about baptism and so on and so forth, and they say, you know, I, I want to be baptized. No, no, let's not even talk about that. <laughs> Why bother teaching them if we don't take seriously when they want to do something about what they've been taught? I also think a child is responsible for the gospel when he or she is able to make decisions based on an understanding of what is right and what is wrong. You know, babies and small children are innocent of sin not because they never do anything selfish or wrong. I mean, anybody who's raised children knows that. They remain innocent because they do not understand yet that sin is an offense against a higher power than mom and dad. We don't make final judgments for the soul of our children. Therefore, just understanding right and wrong because mom and dad say so, that's one thing. But when they begin to perceive that right and wrong is something that goes beyond mom and dad, that all of us answer to a higher power, then they're starting to become responsible for the gospel. 
In other words, a child is ready to respond when its conscience becomes sensitive to the fact that sin is wrong and punishable by God, not just by mom and dad. This is how we know that the knowledge of right and wrong exists within them. Because all of a sudden, the idea that I did something right or that I did something wrong is pleasing or displeasing to a higher power than mom and dad. When you begin to see that in your child, then you begin to, you, you as parents, grandparents, relatives, you need to uh, understand that they are getting closer and closer to the understanding and responsibility to the gospel. A child is also responsible when he or she can grasp the idea of lostness and being saved from lostness. You know, when children understand the relationship between forgiveness and salvation, I say they're, they're ready. When my children were small and they were punished in some way, uh, there would be a time after the spanking, if they were very little, or the time out, or the punishment, or whatever, you know, there'd be a time after when I would go in and I would hold them in my arms and we'd talk and we'd review the events and there would be hugs and there would be kisses. And that was my way of, of saying to them that everything was okay, that daddy was not angry with them, that the punishment part of what they had done, is, it's over now. Forgiveness had taken place. We turn a new page, you know, we're starting over again. We're starting fresh. How else do children understand forgiveness if, they don't, if they're not walked through it by their parents? Well, when a child understands the concept of forgiveness, that child is old enough to be baptized with the idea that this is how God forgives. You know, I've said many times, baptism is how God puts you on His knee and hugs you and tells you that everything is okay now. It's okay, you don't have to be worried. And so children who can acknowledge that they believe what they've been taught about Christ, and children who know that wrong brings punishment not just by parents but by God as well, and children who understand forgiveness and are subject to and responsible to the idea of forgiveness, they're becoming ready to respond to the gospel. So I've talked about the, the children's side, again, a very sensitive issue. Well, let's talk about the parental side, the responsibility of parents in this regard. Parents also have a responsibility in regards to their children and the gospel. First of all, we have to teach them, first and foremost, I mean, 2 Timothy 3.15, you know, Paul says to Timothy, from an early age you have known the holy writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Oh, who taught him that? He didn't learn the gospel, he didn't learn the holy writings, for him the holy writings. He didn't learn these things by osmosis, he was, he was taught, in his case, by his mother and his, his grandmother. Thankfully, in the area of teaching children, we have help, and we have students who are actually ready to learn. Education research tells us that children are easily reached. That's a good thing. Adults are, you know, adults are busy, but kids are eager to learn and know more about Jesus. <clears throat> I mean, kids love VBS. If you don't believe that, you ought to come here on a VBS night, even if you don't have any children, just to soak up the enthusiasm. They love it. Now this year, or last year, last summer, you know, we said, let's do it five nights, you know, and people are going, five nights. It wasn't the kids who were saying, oh, five nights. They weren't. It was the parents who were saying, five nights. Oh my, I'll be exhausted. But you didn't see any of the children come up to us after VBS and say, uh, do you mind next year to cut that down to maybe two nights? Could we, could we do it? Could we do that in two nights? Could we get rid of VBS in two? They didn't complain about it. It was the adults, and obviously we're tired, it's a lot of work, and so on and so forth. Children are eager to learn, they love it. They love Sunday school, they love church activities that are designed to teach them, they love it. Another thing that uh, education research has found 
children are actually easy to teach. Adults have a, a lot on their mind, but kids, kids have a clear open mind and they have great memories. All they need is someone or something to fill it with. And you know what, if we don't fill it with the news of the gospel, guess who's going to fill it? I mean, I see our young people here you know, at pre-adolescence already, pre-adolescence. They got phones, they got videos, they're, they're clicking around. You know, we're at the point now where we have to say, everybody turn off your phones, turn off your video. It's like a flight on, on Delta here when we start services. Everybody turn off, except those who are using their tablets to you know, follow the Bible. But I suspect sometimes maybe somebody's checking basketball scores, but anyways, we won't get into that right now. It's a whole other sermon. I'll let Marty preach that sermon. But you know what I'm saying? They, they have access to millions and millions of pieces of information and pictures and so on and so forth. If we do not put the information of the gospel in their hearts while they're young, trust me, somebody else will put pictures and ideas in their hearts instead of the gospel. All they need is somebody to teach them. And children are easily convinced, and some say, oh, well, that's manipulative. Really? That's just the way they are. You know, how are we as adults? Adults, we doubt. We're cynical, you know, been there, done that type of thing. We're full of sinfulness, and so because we're full of sinfulness, we, we resist. But children, children are anxious to do what's right. They're anxious to please God. Better we convince them of Jesus early on because society will do its best to convince them that there is no God. No such thing as a vacuum in this society. If we don't fill it up with the knowledge of God, the world will fill them up with the knowledge that there is no God and plenty of arguments to support that false idea. So the first responsibility of parents is to see to it that their children learn about Jesus. The problem is never the eagerness or the willingness of the children. It's always the parents who fail to bring them to be taught or neglect to teach them themselves. And I'm, you know, I'm not here to lay a guilt trip on everybody, but if the shoe fits, you know, wear it. Wear it. It was marked in the bulletin all week. It was on the website all week. We were going to talk about leading children to Christ tonight. Look around. Am I mistaken? Am I overstating my case? I don't think so. The second thing we have to do as parents is we have to aim them. Raising Christian children is like shooting an arrow at a target. We're the bow. They are the, arc, uh, the, the, uh, the arrow and Jesus is the target. We cannot expect to hit the target if we don't aim at it. The Bible tells us that we should raise our children with the express purpose that they will become servants of God. I have never apologized, certainly to my children, for the, for the fact that I was purposefully trying to bring them to Christ, make them believe and obey Christ and become servants of Christ in the church of Christ. I've never had to apologize for that. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm pressuring you into belief in Jesus. Uh-uh, that's what I'm doing. And so long as I have influence on you, that's what I'm going to do. We don't raise them and hope that they'll become Christians by some fluke. We raise them as Christians to act like Christians in order to become Christians. And the sooner that they decide to obey the gospel, the less of their lives that they will waste. Those people who have become Christians you know, at an older age, like myself, and I know there are many of you like that out there. You know, I was like 30 when I was baptized. And I look at my life before 30 as a waste of time. I mean, literally a waste of time. My life began. I mean, I know my spiritual life began, but I mean my real life began when I became a Christian. Wouldn't it have been wonderful for me to have had the first 30 years in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? 
You know, parents must not feel guilty or embarrassed if they regularly insist on VBS. Yes, we're going to VBS. Again tonight, yes, tonight and every night that they're having it. And yes, you're going to youth camp. Oh, but I want to go to, no, no, you're, you're going to Bible camp. And their youth activity, oh, but they're on Monday nights and we go swimming at my buddy's house. Yeah, well, you can go swimming at your buddy's house on Tuesday because Monday is the area-wide youth activity and you're going to go to that. And we have to go to church on Sunday night. Dad, I got homework. You should have done your homework Friday. We shouldn't be feeling guilty because we expect Christian behavior in the home and at school because that's what we are and that's what we're aiming our children towards. I never apologize for that. I've told you this before, you know, when the kids were younger, Paul being the oldest one, he thought he was the uh, lawyer for the family. You know, if he could win his case with me, he'd win it for the other three. And when he kept going on and on and on, I said, look, I said, this is just the way it's going to be because I'm your father and this is the way that we've set it out. And anyways, God has given me the responsibility to do this. And he'd say, oh, there you go, bringing God into it again. <laughs> no fair, Dad, with the Bible. <laughs> you know, we don't always hit the target we don't always hit the target. The best effort we make, sometimes we miss the target. But let's at least aim at the target. Because we'll never hit it if we don't even aim at it. So let me kind of summarize this here. What does this mean for us as parents? What does it mean for us as children? Well, first of all, it means that if you're a young person who wants to be a Christian, who wants to go to heaven, then talk to your parents about it and don't put it off to another time. Get into that conversation, it's okay. Parents can say, well, I don't feel you're ready yet, but let's continue to study. There are things that you need to know, but at least let's get that dialogue going. And secondly, if you're a parent, it means you have a great challenge before you. It means you have to go against the flow of a hectic lifestyle. You have to go against materialism in our world. You have to go against a godless media in many instances. You have to go against a society that exalts immorality. Imagine, we make heroes out of adulterers and fornicators and idolaters. These are our heroes. And we have to go against all of this and establish the salvation of your child's soul as a priority. You know, parents often say, all I want is for my child to be happy. And I'll tell you, your child will not be happy if he lives his life without Jesus Christ. If you really want happy children, give them Jesus and give them Jesus as soon as possible. It's not a type of thing you put off till next year. In Matthew 19, 14, we see the invisible hands of parents bringing their children to be blessed by Christ. I encourage all of you here, let their example be our guide as we gently push our own children away from ourselves and into the loving arms of our Lord Jesus Christ so He can become their Lord as well. I don't normally do this, you know, do poems and things, but someone gave me a poem based on this idea, a very short one, I'd like to finish the lesson tonight with it. It's called A Little Child's Dad and it's by Lloyd Kirick who lives in Edmond. He says, I may never be as clever as my neighbor down the street. I may never be as wealthy as some other men I meet. I may never have the glory that some other men have had, but I've got to be successful as a little child's dad. There are certain dreams I cherish that I'd like to see come true. There are things I would accomplish ere my working time is through, but the task my heart is set on is to guide a little lad 
and make myself successful as that little child's dad. It is that one job I dream of. It's the task I think of most. If I'd fail that growing youngster, I'd have nothing else to boast. For though wealth and fame I'd gather, all my future would be sad if I failed to be successful as that little child's dad. I may never get earth's glory, I may never gather gold. Men may count me as a failure when my business life is told, but if the child who follows me is Christian, I'll be glad, for I know I've been successful as a little child's dad. I think he summarizes very well the thoughts and ideas in our lesson tonight. So I encourage you, of course, if you are someone that needs to respond to the gospel as we offer the invitation at every opportunity, then we encourage you to believe in Jesus Christ, to express that faith in repentance and baptism. We are ready to hear that confession. We're ready to baptize you uh, this evening. But I also encourage parents and grandparents to remember the things that I've spoke to you about tonight and make it your mission in life to encourage your children to come to Christ and to encourage your children to teach their children about Jesus Christ. And if you need help in that, then we have many experienced parents and teachers in this congregation to help you. And I think we'll also have a video that you can pass on to someone to encourage them in this endeavor. If you need to respond in any way to the congregation or for prayers for your personal life, we encourage you to come forward now as Bob leads us in our uh, song of encouragement.